Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we come to the book of Psalms. We are in Psalm number 50, and we will pick up our study in verse 16. This is our 18th study in the book of Psalms. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, Amen. I said we're going to start reading in uh, or start studying in verse 16, but I want to go back and begin reading in verse 9. Now, Israel was a very religious people in this t- at this time. They were really a, a very well-oiled religious machine. The problem is they didn't have a heart for God. They were not living for God the way they should. And so, with that in mind, God says in verse 9, I will accept no bull from your house, nor he goat from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. And now, verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes, or take my covenant on your lips? In other words, God says, I'm not impressed that you can quote my word. I'm not impressed that you know my word. He says, why do you talk about my word? Try to be so pious about my word. If you don't care about it enough to live it, even try to live to try to live it. God's saying, I'm not impressed. 17. For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. In other words, I can't get you to repent. And no one enjoys discipline, but people who have a heart for God know when they have it coming, they do not despise it, even though it hurts. 18. If you see a thief, you are a friend of his, and you keep company with adulterers. In other words, they not only enjoyed their own sins, they enjoyed the sins of others. Wicked people are that way. They love their sins. They also love the sins of others. They actually enter into those sins of others mentally and, I don't know, get some sort of second-hand enjoyment from them. The sickening thing to God is when those same people talk so piously about His Word, even as they are secretly enjoying the sins of others without repenting of that. 19. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. And there's something very unnatural about family members turning against each other. <clears throat> and yet, that's what the Israelites were guilty of. They lost that natural affection. And the Bible warns that in the last days that will be one of the signs of great ungodliness a lack of natural affection and no amount of stale religious activity like the Israelites were practicing can make up for that type of unnatural sinful behavior 21 these things you have done and I have been silent You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. They thought, well, now, since God has not punished us, since he has not killed us and sent us to hell, he must not care that we are sinning. He must approve of our lifestyle. Wrong, says God. God is patient, but God's patient should never be confused as being his approval. Just because God doesn't punish right away doesn't mean that he approves of your lifestyle. 22. Mark this, then, 
you who forget God, lest I rend and there be none to deliver. Boy, once God rends, no one delivers. When God tears someone apart because of their sin and because they refuse to repent, no one will be able to put them back together again. No one can deliver somebody who hasn't repented from hell. And there isn't a psychologist or a psychotherapist on earth who can reverse the effects of God's punishment. 23. He who brings thanksgiving as his sacrifice honors me. To him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. Those who live the way God wants them to live will be saved. That's what it says. To him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. There is no salvation for the ungodly who refuse to repent. There is no salvation for them. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. You can find the exact opposite. That You, you can't find that there's salvation for the ungodly. You just can't find it. Those who live the way God wants them to live will be saved. That doesn't mean you earn your salvation. That doesn't mean you can you never sin. It means after you sin, you repent, you confess, you turn back to God. That's real faith. Psalm 51. This is a psalm of David, a prayer of David for mercy. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. According to thy steadfast love, blot out my transgressions. It is impossible to earn forgiveness. We must ask for forgiveness. That's our only hope. Our suffering can satisfy the justice of God for the temporary consequences of our sin, the earthly consequences, but but forgiveness and the elimination of the eternal consequences of sin only happens when God shows mercy. It must be asked for. It cannot be earned. To wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. An infected sore could possibly kill you if it isn't cleaned. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. A soul infected with sin is going to result in hell if it isn't cleaned. And that's what Jesus does. He cleans our soul. You repent. You receive Christ. You confess your sin. He scrubs your soul clean. Makes you clean. Makes you fit for heaven. It's the only way any of us can be clean. 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Part of God's discipline is to make His children aware of their sin. It's to make their children aware and feel terrible when they sin. God turns up the feelings of guilt so that His children will confess and repent. And His children will confess and repent. <clears throat> 4. David says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned. Stop there. Well, you know what? David sinned against a lot of people. And yet he says against you, God, and you only have I sinned? He says that because all sin is first and foremost an assault on God. Even if you sin against someone else, even if they sin against you, primarily sin is against God. That's why God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Someone sins against you, you don't have to get them back. God says, that's my business. They sinned against me too, you know. For again, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified in thy sentence and blameless in thy judgment. Notice what he said. I have sinned and done that which is evil in thy sight. When we break a commandment, we do evil. That's what it is. It is evil. And I know people like to water that down and change the terminology, but there's no point in renaming it something less offensive it just it won't do any good because renaming it doesn't make it any less than what it is it is evil period no excuses for any of my sins at all it is evil no excuses for any of us our sin is evil period 
we must admit that we must accept that fact admit it and confess it to God as such and no excuses God's grace doesn't doesn't forgive any excuses but it forgives all sins when they are confessed 5 behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me he said I've been a sinner since the day I was born everybody everybody comes into this world sinner a sinner and we immediately go in the wrong direction toward, the, toward sin toward evil we are all just a chip off the old block as it were unfortunately the old block is a vile depraved block of sin called Adam and Eve we sin because we have inherited our sin nature from Adam and Eve 6 behold thou desirest truth in the inward being that is talking about sincerity God looks at our heart none of us are perfect but he wants us to have a heart after him sincerity is the thing that God desires hypocrisy is something that is evil pretending to want what is right pretending to do what is right that is a great evil to God and we may not always do what is right but God wants us to at least have a heart after him and when we, con and when we sin to confess it turn back to him behold thou desirest truth in the inward being therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart and God will believe me if we want wisdom God will give it to us all we have to do is ask for it you ask for wisdom he'll find ways of putting it into your soul you ask for wisdom you'll get it as you learn the Word of God he will infuse your soul with wisdom he'll give it to us by showing us the foolishness of our mistakes and the mistakes of others he'll point things out to you you'll say see that that was foolish don't do that 7 David prays purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow hyssop is a bush a leafy bush the Israelites used hyssop sort of like a paintbrush to apply the Passover lamb's blood to their door down in Egypt remember that and that blood saved the firstborn from death and so hyssop here is a figure of speech it refers to blood specifically the blood of Christ and so when David says purge me with hyssop he's saying purge me with the blood of Jesus Play, purge me with purge me with sacrificial blood that I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow that blood on the lamb's door saved the firstborn from death the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us that cleanses us from the evil that we have done makes us white before God pure Eight, fill me with the joy and gladness let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice he's hurting he's hurting because of his sin feels like all his bones are broken I hate it when I sin it makes me sick because it offends God and God deserves better he really does but I hate sin also because it makes me feel lousy and to be honest with you I should feel lousy until I confess it I should I should probably feel worse than what I do but as a broken bone a broken bone causes physical pain sin causes spiritual pain and that's good because it reveals that there's something wrong we need to correct something somewhere 9 hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities the blood of Christ will not remove the temporary consequences of our sin but the blood of Christ does remove the guilt of our sin and the dirty stain that sin leaves behind it does remove that and you know how good it feels to get rid of any stain you get rid of a stain out of your shirt or your carpet or something you feel good about that well it also feels real good knowing that not only is sin removed and guilt removed but the stain that sin has left behind 
is removed from our soul as well through the forgiveness that is found through Jesus Christ. 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. In other words, fill me with clean thoughts and good desires. And putting the word of God in you is the best way, best way I know of to accomplish that. There are so many things in the world, so many things coming from so many different directions that want to pump dirty thoughts and bad desires into people's minds. We need the word of God to drive that garbage out. 11. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David sinned. He knows he deserves to be cast away from God so he prays God don't do it. And God won't cast anyone aside if they want to be with him like David wanted to be with him. God will not banish anyone to hell if they want to spend eternity with him. No way. David did not go to hell. He sure deserved to go to hell with the sins he committed <laughs> no doubt he deserved to go to hell but he didn't go there because after he sinned he always returned to God and always confessed those sins and always got back on track 12 restore to me the joy of thy salvation sin leads to sadness and to be frank with you it should The first thing a depressed Christian should do is examine their conscience to see if there's any sins that they have not repented of or confessed. I'm not saying that all sadness is brought on by sin. Not at all. But a lot of it is. So, a depressed Christian should always examine their conscience and especially check to see if there's any attitude sins. Sinful pride they'll steal your joy envy you want something that somebody else has hatred unforgiveness these are all attitude sins and attitude sins are very sneaky very slick they can slide in don't even realize you have them and they are joy killers 13 then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will return to thee He's saying, God, if you forgive me and restore me to you, I will tell others what you did for me, and then others will experience your forgiveness also. It is only natural for one who has been forgiven by God to want to see others forgiven as well. 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. That's physical death. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of thy deliverance. David knows that the penalty for willful sin is death, and he's guilty of willful sin. He deserves death, and he knows it. God said, The soul that sins will die, and there was no sacrifice for willful sin. Even in the Old Testament, and he is asking God not to sentence him to death. And he knows that God is the only one who can call off his death sentence. God is the eternal judge, and therefore only God can grant us a pardon. Verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou hast no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldest not be pleased. He's saying, God, you don't want me to pay for my sin you don't want me to try to make up for my sin and someone would say, might say well wait a minute John the Baptist said bring forth fruit that fits repentance and there are a lot of examples in the Bible who people with people having to make up for their sins David he was forgiven his horrible sins but God still ordained suffering because of those sins That is penance. Making up for a person's sin. Not buying forgiveness. Not earning forgiveness. You can't do that. Penance doesn't bring forgiveness. True penance doesn't do that. True penance isn't an attempt to buy forgiveness. True penance, doing good after you have done bad, 
helps to reverse the bad effects that sin has done to our souls. But you can't earn forgiveness. So David says, you don't want that. Then he says in verse 17, The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. God wants a sinner to be broken over their sin. You should feel horrible about your sin. That's the way it should be. Confess at that time. God will forgive you. He's looking for a broken spirit. He wants to see sorrow to the point of repentance. He wants to see sorrow to the point of a humble submission to the consequences, knowing that you've got it coming. And a desire to make up for our bad by doing good, to try to reverse the negative effects on our souls by doing something positive, that is the fruit that fits repentance that John the Baptist was talking about. That God wants that sort of thing. Absolutely. 18. Do good to Zion in thy pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. David is asking God not to punish Israel because of his sin. Don't do that, Lord. It is a sad thing for sure when a godly person sins and then sees others, the innocent, suffer because of his sin. 19. Then wilt thou delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on thy altar. When our hearts are right with God, then he appreciates the good works that we will do for him. If we are not right with God, if we have not repented, if we don't care about the Lord, we can do all sorts of good things, all sorts of religious things, and they don't amount to a hill of beans in God's mind. Psalm 52, Why do you boast, O mighty man, of mischief done against the godly? God calls him sarcastically, O mighty man. A person has a twisted idea of what it means to be a mighty man, a hero type, somebody special if they boast about the evil they have done to a good person or to an innocent person they are really twisted in their thinking Two. all day all the day you are plotting destruction your tongue is like a sharp razor you worker of treachery God gives some people intelligence as a gift it's like he gives some people musical talent as a gift and they use it to do evil some people do that with intelligence they waste the gift that God has given them often they misuse it by using it to plot sinful things 3. you love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth you can ask one of the great thinkers why a person does bad things ask one of the intelligent people of the world today you know, why does a person do bad things? And they'll probably write 20 volumes worth of excuses and theories. You ask God the same question, he gives a straight answer. He cuts right to the heart of the, of the issue. It is because they love evil more than they love good. And that's true. We all have a free will. So if we sin, it is because at that moment, we love evil more than we love good. There's no other, there's no other explanation for it. And it's a horrible thing when we do that. Notice verse 4. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. Yeah, some people are constantly putting others down. Some people say bad things about others, trash others. I guess it makes them feel good about themselves. But people whose walk with the Lord is good, they don't do that. Because they are content. They don't have to trash others to feel good about themselves because their walk with the Lord is what it should be. 5. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. To uproot from the land of the living means to drag you away from the land of the living. That's what God will do to the wicked. He will uproot them, drag them away. Oh, and the wicked, they are fearful of dying. Or at least they should be because they're not ready to go. But God will drag them away from the land of the living anyway. And many times the wicked, they, they will try to hang on so hard. But they get pulled into eternity anyway. 
6. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his wealth. The righteous will see the end result of the wicked. They will say, See what happens to those who despise God and trust in their material things and just go deeper into sin. In other words, no one who continues on with God through Jesus Christ will ever regret it on Judgment Day when the foolishness of rejecting Almighty God will be clearer than ever. 8. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. He says, uh, I'm like a sheltered olive tree that God himself protects. This man this man knows he cannot earn forgiveness or eternal life and he's not going to trust in anything other than the mercy of God his attitude is God is good he loves me even though I don't deserve it and I am trusting in that for eternity and nothing else and a person's got to be a fool to trust in something other than that 9 I will thank thee forever because thou hast done it I will proclaim thy name for it is good in the presence of the godly God's mercy will be so clear to us when we see the nail scars that we will thank him forever for what he has done and we will praise him for his holy justice which will send those who love their sin and despise God's gracious gift of eternal life to eternal hell we're going to praise God for his mercy towards those who repent we're going to praise God for his justice which will be poured out